Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father, we thank you for this Palm Sunday. We thank you for the gift that you've given to this whole world, Lord. And we just pray that you use Pastor Izzy now. Lord, keep the distractions away, Lord. Keep the rain away, Lord, so that we can be fed this morning, your people, your sheep. You're the good shepherd. So feed us this morning, Lord. We just pray that and ask that now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Well, guys, would you turn in your Bibles to Matthew 21 this morning? Now, we're studying the wonderful part of Scripture where we're looking at the Palm Sunday message. And this is really fun for me because this is one of the, uh, you know, this one I get to do every year. And so every year I find, I pray, Lord, what part would you like me to share? Because this is actually recorded for us in all four of the Gospels. It's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each of them tell us different things about the day that Jesus rode into the city there, into, the, into Jerusalem and went into the temple. Remember, he, he's going to go in and he's going to overturn the money changers' tables and he's going to get a whip actually and drive them out and say, you guys are making this into like all about merchandise and, and you're merchandising the gospel. He said, get out of here. This is my father's house. And what did he say? My father's house is to be a house of what? Prayer. Prayer. Not a house full of, uh, of robbery of people that, you know, people were coming there with their desire to worship God and to bring their offerings to God and honor him. And instead, there were fellows that were going, hey, this is a great chance to um, sell some t-shirts or sell some knickknacks. You know, that's what, I mean, do we have that today in, in Christianity where guys do that? They st they're still doing this. I wonder if Jesus would overturn some of the, the, the things that, you know, when you walk into some fellowships, first thing you're hit with is the bookstore and, the, and all the stuff to buy. And I don't think that's what we're supposed to do. When we come together, we're supposed to pray. The power is in prayer, not in buying Jesus stuff. You know, I, I, I tell them it's Jesus junk. You know, they put Jesus' name on all sorts of junk. Pens, paper, you know, cups, and sell it and say, hey, this, is, this makes it more, more sanctified. Guys, what makes things sanctified is prayer. Prayer and the Holy Spirit of God is what gives us the true sanctification that we need. So today we're going to look at Matthew 21, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just highlight one part of this message. Now, last year... I explained that the, the disciples, uh, you know, um, went to get the donkey like Jesus instructed them. Didn't give you too much about that, but just that they obeyed and did it because we looked at John's gospel. And John just jumps in with the fact that, you know, Jesus wanted a donkey. They got the donkey like Presto Changeo doesn't tell how they got the donkey. Just And they got the donkey for him and he rode in. And But in John's gospel, John's going to give us some details that we're going to turn to in just a minute that he explains why was there such a big crowd around this day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. If you don't know the backstory, this is a really juicy part. How come so many people showed up that day and threw down the branches in front of the donkey? And how come they were all crying out, Hosanna, save now, save now? Well, I'll show you that in just a minute. But before I do, I want to show you the part, what Matthew records for us, and Luke does, and, and John. I'm sorry, and Mark, not John. The other three gospel writers tell us just a little neat detail about the day that they had to go get the donkey. And the reason I think this is super cool is, well, I'll show you. Let's look at Matthew 21. It says here, when they had approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives. That's just across the, 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 the little valley there uh, fr from Jerusalem. If you've seen pictures of the old city Jerusalem with the beautiful like kind of golden color hue wall of stone and then up on the top there there's that golden mosque that was the original temple mount that Solomon built and the garden of Gethsemane is across the little valley from it looks right at the gate beautiful you can see right in, uh, at Jerusalem this is where they came to Bethpage was a little little s town on that other hill and it's not when I say across the valley don't think like Arizona big valleys think like a little wash like a little um you know, just a little depression in the ground from one little hill to another little hill. It's a, it's, it's a really short, like it, it wouldn't take you about five minutes to run down the hill, across and back up the other hill. That's how, that's how close it is. 
So they're right there looking at Jerusalem. And, they, and Jesus says to them, as they're in the Mount of Olives, it says, Matthew tells us he sent two of his disciples. Now, Matthew doesn't tell us who it was. Just as two guys got the job. Now, anyone who had volunteered to go get the donkey for Jesus, if you, you know, Jesus said, hey, I need two of you guys. Go get the donkey. Who would go with me? I'll be one. I only need one more. Anybody else? Me and Pete, we're going to do. Okay, so, so it, I mean, if we could go back in time, I just want to show you, if you were the one that went to get the donkey, I want to show you something about how I believe it would really increase your faith to do this task that Jesus assigned you. Because Jesus said to them, go into the village opposite you. Look at verse 2. And he said to them, and immediately you will find a donkey that is tied there. It will, and there will be a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. Now here he's, he's telling them, there is a donkey tied up with a what? A colt, a baby donkey. And if we had time, I'd take you through all the Gospels. It says there's actually a donkey, the baby, that, on which no one had ever ridden yet. So it's a brand new baby donkey that no one's ever, no one's ever gotten on top of. And we went in detail last year over this, but what would be the problem with putting your legs over a donkey that's never been sat on? What's it going to do? I mean, those of you who have been around a farm, it's going to kick you right off. I mean, the first ride is not usually fun. It's like, it's like taming a horse, only worse. They, they're known for having a bit of a stubbornness about them. That, you know. And so <clears throat> Jesus says, go get them. Now, he says them. He doesn't say, go get the, the, just the baby donkey. He says, get the mother donkey, and the, the baby's going to follow the mom. I don't know if you know this, but you know, it's just the way they work. You get the mom, bring her, baby comes with. Well, and, and then Jesus said, now, if anyone says anything to you, just tell them, the Lord has need of them, and immediately they will send them. Well, Matthew goes on and tells us this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Written, it says, in, in, in Isaiah, it says, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of the beast of burden. Zechariah also prophesied this in Zechariah 9, verse 9. This very part of this passage, he said that your king is going to come humbly on a, on a baby donkey. Not on a, you know, when you think of a king coming, don't you usually think stallion, you know, big fancy horse that, you know, he's gonna, the king's going to get the most prominent horse. Here's the king of kings of all creation, and what's he come riding in on? A baby donkey. I mean, this is not what... Uh, what, what kind of king is this? And the disciples, it says, went and they did as Jesus instructed. And they brought the donkey and the colt and they laid their coats on them and, and he sat on, on the coats. And most of the crowd spread out their coats in the road and others were cutting down branches of trees and spreading them in the road and the crowds were going ahead of him. And, and those that were following, they were shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Here they are quoting Psalm 118, this cry out that was a prophetic psalm. Have you guys read Psalm 118? Any of you had a chance to see that? Is it, turn to Psalm 118 for just a second. I'm not going to, it's, it's a kind of long psalm, but I just want to do the last couple verses for you because it's one of those prophetic psalms that says that, the, that we should give thanks to the Lord for he is good and that his mercies or his loving kindness are, are everlasting. They never stop. The mercy of the Lord is forever. But if you look at the last paragraph of this psalm, Psalm 118, it says here in this psalm, verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the what? The chief cornerstone. Now this was the Lord's doing and it was marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O oh Lord, do save, we beseech you. O oh Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Now this, O oh Lord, do save, we beseech you. The, the, that translation is into English, so we would understand it. In the Hebrew, it's Hosanna. Hosanna. In other words, O oh Lord, you're the Lord. We recognize you're the one with power. You're the had the position of being the master of the universe. Do save us. 
You're crying out to a guy. Now, this isn't like just saying, crying out to, you know, you're, you're, you're in trouble and you need someone to give you a helping hand. Save me, help me, you know. This is crying out when you, when you have a problem and you need the authority to help you. The one who's got real power over life. You need his help. So this is the word they used. Oh, Lord, do save, we beseech you. Hosanna. Oh, Lord, we beseech you. Do send prosperity. And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you, it says, from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind, it says, the festive, festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I give you thanks. You are my God, and I extol you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his loving kindness is everlasting. This is a beautiful psalm, but this psalm has a really deep meaning. This is a psalm that was a prophetic psalm that was saying, there's going to be a sacrifice bound to the altar. What, what sacrifice was about to be made? Anyone know where we are in the story of, well, next week we have Easter, right? So what's going to happen on the Good Friday? We call it good because somebody was a sacrifice. I mean, it's not good for Jesus. It was good for us. Jesus became the Lamb of God that would take away our sins. And this, this week we celebrate remembering that on Good Friday, he gave his life to be the, the festival sacrifice, as it speaks of, that, that is going to come. And he's going to bring, well, Jesus said, you are the light. Oh, God, you have given us light. Jesus was the light of the world coming. And he's about to shine the brightest light that could possibly be shown. The light is going to be on a certain focal point. And that point is that we have sin that needs to be paid for by someone who's sinless. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to be the perfect sacrifice to take away our sins. And so here they start crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now, this prophetic psalm. Now, I had a question. Do you think the religious leaders were familiar with this Psalm 118? They knew it. And just to show you, Matthew's, Matthew's gospel goes on and tells us that Jesus then went, entered the, the, uh, the temple in verse 12, and that's where he drove out the money changers and those that were buying and selling and, he, and, he, and, he, and selling the doves. And he said, get out of here. This is, it is, as it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The, they, were, they had twisted what worship of God was all about into making money. We, we don't have that in our culture at all, right? There's no guys twisting the gospel from, man, I can't stand it. So I, I don't know, sometimes I can't listen to some of the preachers on, even on our television because they're always pleading about money and give us money and money. And I'm like, that's not the good news. God's not broke. I'm here to tell you, God is not broke. And God knows everything we need. He says, you seek him first. He will add all these things to you. Right? Doesn't it say Matthew 6, 33? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all, all, does it say all? All these things shall be added to you. What things? He just got done telling them. The things that the Gentiles eagerly seek after, what they should put on, what they should, what they should eat, you know, where are they going to sleep, all this stuff like, what am I going to eat, what am I going to have to wear, what am I going to, you know, where am I going to put my head at? All the stuff that we need is going to be provided. I'm only pointing this out because I think it takes away from the message of the gospel that, I mean, Jesus goes into the temple and throws the guys out that are making money off of people's desire to worship. Those people were going there to worship God, and, the, and the, these robbers were going, oh, it's gullible people, they're such simpletons, we can, they, they want to worship God, let's sell them something to give to God. And they had a racket going. They used to take the people, they'd bring their, their, their offering, and they, maybe they brought a lamb, they go, has that been expected by the priest? Does it have a, a seal of acceptance? You know, you need to go get your seal over there. Give a couple shekels and, and they'll check it out for you. And, and then if the person brought their, their, their sheep and they went, oh, it's got a little blemish. But we've got one over here that's already been examined. We'll give us that one and a couple shekels and we'll give you a good sheep to offer to God. They used to like, do this swap out thing. And then when the person passed on, they just put a ribbon around that one and get the next sucker that came up. I mean, this is terrible to say, but... Some men take advantage of people's desire to worship God and, and they steal from them. And Jesus had nothing to do with it. Get out of here. 
You guys get out. Now, does anyone like this story? Would you, who would go with me to watch him chuck these guys out? I, I would love, I mean, I'd be like, go Jesus, you know? This would be, because, I mean, really, those kind of guys don't need to be in church. They don't need to be where the people are trying to worship God. They, they take away. They, in fact, to me, I don't know about you, but before I was ever a Christian, they, those kind of guys turned me off to the gospel. It may, something in my brain said, that's not correct. And it made me not want to be around it. It, it, it. Unfortunately, it had the bad effect of making me want to stay away from the place I needed to be. But it wasn't because the place of worship was bad. It was because of these guys that had crept in, these, these thieves that had made worship of God into something it was not meant to be. So Jesus dealt with those guys. On this very day, you can remember this in your mind, what day did he kick them out? The day they put the palm leaves down in front of him when he was riding the donkey. But see, Jesus, Jesus was trying to teach a lesson, and the lesson actually began, Matthew's telling us, the lesson began when they got over to the hill opposite the city before they ever rode in. That's when the lesson began. He told two of the guys, go over there, and you're going to find in the city opposite us, you're going to find two donkeys. Now, a lot of people don't point this out, but Matthew, did you notice he said, go get them? He didn't say, go get it. Go get them. You got the mom donkey tied up and the baby. And the baby might not have been tied up. I don't know if the baby would be tied up. But if you got the mom tied, what happens with the baby? It stays by it, right? I mean, it's not going to go away. Just go untie her and lead them to me. And Matthew tells us they did it. Now, who would volunteer? No, wait, wait. I should tell you something here. In Mark's gospel, Mark does the same thing. He, he tells us in Mark 11 that... Uh, that they approach the, the, the same mount, everything's the same. And then verse 2, they said, go, he said, go to the village opposite you, and immediately when you enter it, you will find a colt tied there. Oh, wait, the colt is tied. And on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. Now, if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? What do you answer? The Lord says he has need of it. And immediately they will send it back here. Now, you, you might not get this, but in their culture, if you went and untied someone's donkey and started leading it away, would this be a good idea? No, I mean, well, this, is, this would be like us going up to someone's garage and, and getting the keys and getting in their car and starting backing out of their driveway, you know? And they'd be like, what are you doing with my car? Because a donkey to them, that was, that was a, well, that's like a four by four, really, because they're all terrain. They can do, you know, hills and trails. and they're, 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 They'd be like stealing someone. I mean, think about this. A horse, a donkey. These, are, these were valuable things, possessions in the folks' lives at this time. Big time. This would be like stealing a car. Now, if I said who would go with me, but I, since Pete volunteered, when we're walking, we'd probably start discussing, so who's going to untie the donkey? I'm going to be, Pete, you untie it. <laughs> You untie it, Pete, and, and if they ask anything, I'll tell them the Lord has need of it. Because why would I want him to untie it and not me? Because he'll be the thief. And what do they do to thieves in the Middle East? Yeah, cut off their hands. You untie it, Pete. I'll, I'll tell them the Lord has need of it. I'm not doing that part, right? But it says that they went and they did. Mark tells us that, they, that while, while they were doing this, some of the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they spoke to them and said, well, Jesus said what he had told them. They, they said, Jesus said, um, the Lord has need of it. And, and they went, okay, take it. And they brought the colt to Jesus and they put their coats on it. Now they went on and this is, this is what... Um, what Mark's gospel fills me in, that they did get the baby was tied up. You get to pick up different things from different parts. But here, I get, I get a part to me in both of these gospels that two guys got told to do this, and they went and did it. And they got to have the privilege of getting the ride that Jesus was going to take to go into Jerusalem on, to fulfill what Matthew said. This was spoken of the Messiah. So just so that the people would know who's the right guy, one of the signs of the Messiah was he wouldn't come riding in on a stallion. 
That wouldn't make it, if a guy came riding in a stallion and said, I'm the Messiah, would that jibe with all the prophecies? No, they'd be like, sorry, you don't qualify. Wrong guy. I mean, if you're the right guy, you are the son of God sent from him to save us. You have to fulfill every single little part of the story. All those prophetic words spoken of the Messiah had to be fulfilled. And that's why it makes Jesus so, so special. Is that he comes riding in and he, and he knew. Now this is the part I like. Did, did Jesus know stuff that, like some, sometimes we forget this. Jesus knows everything. He knows, does he know where the donkeys are? Yeah. yeah. Does he know what it's going to take to get the donkey? When they, because he told them, and when you untie it and they ask you, what are you doing with it? So did he know that that was going to happen? So just tell them the Lord has need of it. And they're going to say, okay. Now, Pete, I still let you untie it. I know it sounds funny, but I mean, think about this. Pete's there untying it going, I hope nobody says anything. And then they go, hey, what are you doing? Matt, didn't Mark's gospel tell us? And the bystanders were like, what are you doing? Thief. That's what they're, that, that's what they're doing. Thief. You're a thief. I would have jumped in. It's okay. The Lord says he has need of it. And I'd be hoping. Right? I mean, you, uh, would anyone here be thinking in your mind, I hope this works? Because, I mean, you're stealing someone's car. And you're going, I hope that you're good with this because the Lord has need of it. And they go, oh, yeah, okay, go ahead and take it then. That happens all the time, right? No. This is a part of the story that for some reason a lot of folks overlook. That just to get the donkey required some faith on the part of the guys that were sent. That they would trust in the words of Jesus, what Jesus said to do, and they would actually go do it. And we don't know. It doesn't tell us what they said along the way. I bet they were arguing. You untie it. No, you untie it. I'm not, I, you do it. And, you know. This is just my own interjection. I don't know if they really did that. But I, I always try to put myself in the story and think, what would it have been like? And then you bring the donkeys, you got two of them, to Jesus. You got the mother and the baby. And he has you put the blanket on which one? The baby. Not on the mom, on the baby. Which no one has ever ridden. Now last year I pointed out, this in itself is a miracle. Not only does Jesus have the, the knowledge of where the donkeys are and know how to, to get the donkeys procured so that they can do the whole ride, and to get the baby donkey, but he has mastery over creation, including the animal kingdom. Because they put a coats over the back of this donkey, which first off, I don't know if you've ever broken a horse or a donkey, but what happens when you put the first blanket on? Do they like the blanket? I mean, you try to lay it on as soft as you can, and you kind of stand like this. If you've ever done this, you know you guard yourself, because what, what usually happens with their back legs? Whack! You know, as soon as something touches their back, they do not like it. I have not yet to see one horse that goes, oh, go ahead, just throw that horse blanket on my back. I'm good with it. No, there's something wired in them. They're, they're animals. They go, get it off me. Ooh. It's like, like when we see a spider or lands on us, ah! you know? You put a blanket on their back, ah, get it off me. And they start kicking. Now, they didn't just put the coat over the back of this baby donkey. What, what happens? Jesus puts his leg over and sits down on it. No one's ever ridden on this donkey. This is, this, this is the part to me from being on a farm, I think, this is more miraculous than most city folk ever will notice. They'll never even recognize what a miracle this is because the donkey gave him a ride. Oh, and did I mention they were calling out something, crying? It said, hollering, Hosanna, Hosanna. You think they were going like this, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hope you can save us. Nice soft whisper, we don't want to spook the donkey. No, what were they doing? They were crying out, Hosanna, save us now. And they were throwing down their coats and their palm branches. What happens if you throw one of these branches down in front of a baby donkey? And Jesus rides it like it's a parade, just right on into Jerusalem. It shows me his mastery over the animal kingdom. Not only did he know where the provision was 
that the donkey was there, he knew that that donkey would be submissive to him. And he would, he, he's showing his mastery, king of kings, lord of lords, including lord over everything in the, in the land, the sea. Remember when the storm was there and the disciples were like, we're dying, oh, you don't even care, you're sleeping in the back of the boat. Jesus like, gets up, what? It's a storm, we're perishing. He's like, ye of little faith, be still. Goes like that and the storm just stops. And they go, what kind of guy is this? That even the sea and the winds obey him. What does the psalm say? Who commands the wind and the sea according to the psalmist? God. God is the one in charge of the wind and the sea. And they had, him, they, they had God with them. Remember Emmanuel translate to God with us? They had God with them in the boat and they're still freaking out. Ah, it's a storm, it's a storm. We forget who we're working with here. Jesus, Jesus has got mastery over, he knows where the donkeys are. He knows, right, Alfred, he knows where they stay. And he tells them, you guys go get it. And when they, and, and, and he knows exactly what they're going to say when they go to get the, lift the donkey, I mean, untie the donkey. And he goes, just tell them I have need of it. They'll, they'll be good with it. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.